So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Richard Clothier from Phoenix Datacom, and today with our colleagues from Ativo Networks, we're going to talk about reducing the dwell time of advanced threats to real time. So a quick run through of today's agenda. We're going to cover deceiving attacks in order to reduce dwell time from the often quoted 100 plus days down to real time. We'll have a quick demo of how Ativo approaches this on a practical level, and we'll finish with a Q&A session. And please do send me your questions via the private chat facility. I'll bring these out at the end. So to begin with, who is Ativo Networks? Well, Ativo is the leader in deception technology, providing an active defense for early detection, forensics, and automated incident response to in-network cyber attacks. And why have Phoenix Datacom partnered with Ativo? Well, we all know that threat sophistication and volume continue to rise, and trying to find, stop, and investigate the really damaging threats amongst the barrage of criminal cyber activity is one of the key challenges that SecOps teams face. So we approach security with the assumption that automation is now a prerequisite towards a mature security posture. Our webinar series so far has focused on our capability to automate continuous security optimization and threat investigation. Not only does this security posture save time, it enables you to demonstrate the financial benefit your company sees from your security layers. Adding Ativo to our portfolio, we can easily implement deception technology to reduce your dwell time to real time. And without wishing to steal our colleagues' thunder, we also think that safely monitoring an advanced threat that thinks it has reached its target destination will allow you to clearly report on the damage averted and that security budget is spent wisely. But why Ativo Networks? Well, as a value-added reseller, very much in the coalface of the security challenges seen by companies like yours, and with our unique cyber lab for bringing real context to solutions customers have under consideration, we evaluate the options available in the market and partner with the companies we believe to be best available. In the case of automated deception, that's a TiVo Networks. This gives our customers further peace of mind that they're in safe hands when upgrading by Phoenix Datacom. But enough about that. You're all here to learn about how deception technology reduces dwell time. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Mark Howell, VP of Europe at Ativo Networks. Thanks, Richard. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm just great. Is my is my presentation showing everybody? Yeah. Yes. Great, great. Okay. So uh, Richard, thank you. Um, that's a great summary. Um, and you know, I guess I, I should first start off with just introducing um, the two from Ativo. So I'm Mark Howell. I, I run the commercial operations here for Ativo in, in Europe. And Nick Palmer is, is the clever one. And uh, he's the, the, the technical director um, for, for Europe. So I'm delighted to be here today uh, with Phoenix Datacom. I, I should probably uh, also start by saying um, you know, we, we've gone through, you know, we are very selective about um, who we work with um, here at Ativo. Um, I was first, I, I've known of Phoenix Datacom for many years through um, my, my years in the channel. And it was great to meet um, John Carson quite early on uh, here at my time at Ativo. And um, John was very, um, specific with me and said look you know we'll we'll look carefully at your technology we'll assess it we'll test it um and if we think it's right for our customers we'll take it on and you know it, it's quite a refreshing approach actually um and that testing occurred um very great technical team at phoenix datacom they did all their testing and and you know, here we are today. So really pleased to be working with Phoenix Datacom and, you know, the opportunity to present um, to um, some of your customers and prospects. So look, uh, you know, I, I don't want this to be all about Ativo today. I, I want this to be uh, informative, um, edu you know, provide you with some education, hopefully inspire, explain some concepts around cyber deception, maybe converge some thinking 
that's already going on in your organization around deception. Uh, I'm going to talk about deception being complementary um, to a defense in depth strategy. And, and I think one of the things Ativo's done very well is build integrations from the ground up with security solutions that you will already have uh, in your network. And after Nick's uh, presented the architecture uh, and the demo, you know, my, my hope is that you feel um, deception is worth <clears throat> further. And then please, you know, get in touch with your your contacts at Phoenix Datacom and, and they'll work with us um, to work with you to do whatever you need to, to, to move this forward. So just a um, just a polite request. I, I you know, I'd absolutely welcome questions um, throughout the presentation. But if you can go on mute, um, uh, you know, in the meantime, I would very much appreciate it. I, I have similar challenges. I'm at home. You know, I could be burst in on by three children, um, but I, I'm sure I, and I hope that won't happen. So. Um, just one slide on on Ativo. We've actually been around a fair while. Uh, we've been shipping products since 2014. Uh, we were born uh, in Silicon Valley. You know, we're based in Fremont, very close to Tesla. Um, we have around 300 customers now. Um, we have about 200 staff, uh, and and we are we are recognised as the leader in this space. And I'll make sure that um, Phoenix Datacom share with you um, uh, some of the, the more recent um, analyst papers um, that, that talk about the deception market and, and talk about the vendors in this space. We're not the only one in this space. You may already know that. Um, but certainly we feel uh, we have the most technically complete um, and, you know, most effective at detecting attacks early and the ability to contain those attacks and the ability to automatically deal with those attacks um, through integrations. So um, I guess some background. Um, the deception as a as a tactic for um, defense uh, or offense um, has been around for millennia since since you know since the birth of man and you know a, a classic deception was the, the Trojan horse and funnily enough you know we, we now have in in the early days of computer science Trojan horse was quite a common um, term that was used um, but you know, the, the Greeks pretended to sail away. They left the uh, the Trojan horse outside the city of Troy. The, the Trojans dragged it in, thinking it was a present and that the Greeks had, had, had gone off into the sunset. And, and, you know, out came the attackers and slayed the city of Troy. You know, a, a classic deception. And, you know, I, I, I'm a rugby fan. I'm a big sports fan. And any of you that play sport, any of you that follow politics, um, any of you that, that you know follow the, the misinformation, disinformation, deception potentially that we see in in the media and social media uh, will be aware that it's a tactic that's used all the time now to uh, change people's thinking, change the way people do things. And what we're trying to do is to um, manipulate confuse attacker behavior and you know I, I love this um uh, rugby um analogy where you know uh, matt dawson years ago for england was a fantastic proponent of the dummy from the base of the ruck um you know they'd be you know if you're defending your try line a great dummy from the base of the ruck would put the opponents and the attackers offside you'd then have a um a penalty you'd hoof the ball 60 meters up the pitch you'd then have possession and the advantage from a losing position from a simple dummy from the base of the ruck now so effective was that deception that world rugby changed the rules and you now can't do that 
Now, you know, we're in a global cyber war, an information war, and, you know, there, there isn't a, uh, there are no rules of the game. And attackers use deception on us. You know, a spear phishing email is specifically designed to influence our behavior to do something that we wouldn't normally do and, um, you know, give the attacker a point of presence on the machine. Um, a classic deception that gives them an advantage. And, you know, if we look back at military history, um, Operation Mincemeat, for those of you that like history, was an absolutely classic deception where we, we built this. We actually took a body, uh, dressed it up in military clothing, gave it a passport, love letters, plans, dropped it off the beach of Spain. It washed ashore. Spanish gave it to the Germans. They believed the deception. We had ended up attacking through Sicily rather than Sardinia, and it completely changed the course of World War Two. So it's a highly deception is a highly effective strategy that attackers use on us that we absolutely should be using back to create an active cyber defense um, for your organization. Now, um, if we look at um, retired chief of defense intelligence, um, Phil Osborne, um, you know, what he clearly said uh, recently was that you know, deception and counter deception would be absolutely critical to defending the nation and our critical national infrastructure against nation states and against APTs. And we're all up against them. OK, depending on your organization, all of you will have different types of um, high value assets. It could be uh, it could be SCADA, it could be IoT, it could be retail POS machines, it could be military secrets, it could be customer data, credit card information, you name it, that information inside the organization is all real and attackers are after it. And if they can get in, everything inside your organization will be real. Okay, so, um, you know, wh wh why do we exist? Um, so it, it's pretty clear that um, this, this is from a site called Information is Beautiful, and I'll, I'll, I'll share the link um, after the presentation. But it, it graphically shows the, um, the, the, the breaches worldwide that have occurred year on year. And given that um, spending is in, in 2022 going to be about $134 billion, um, you know, and yet these attackers are still getting in and um, exfiltrating information, data, secrets, personal information, whatever it is. You know, is there a time now to kind of change the mindset of, of how we look at security? Um, and rather than just building walls around things, do something a little bit more clever, cunning and active cyber defense. Um, hold on a second. Right. So um, analyst opinions. So there's a lot of um, information out there um, from Gartner, Wellington Research, NIST, MITRE. And I wanted to just cover um, some of these today. So um, some of you may be thinking, look, um, deception. Yeah, I, I know all about it. Um, Actually, if, if you could go on, if you're not on mute, I'd really appreciate it. Um, some of you may be thinking, well, this is just honeypots. Well, uh, it, it's a useful frame of reference, um, but it is at deception, modern day deception, absolutely uh, is not the same um, as deception. Honeypots were always designed to stand out, they were very much often research projects, low interaction. Um, emulations, often outside the network. Um, deception is absolutely designed to blend in, okay, and look like your real assets, okay? And they do look like your real assets because what Nick will share with you later is that by using real operating systems and learning the network 
and even importing your own gold images, we can project deceptive assets, file shares, documents, servers, IoT, SCADA, out onto the network that look identical to your real assets that are outside the workflow of a normal user. So therefore, when a deceptive asset is touched, you absolutely know you have a problem because no legitimate user should be going anywhere near it. That is an absolute air raid siren um, to tell you you have a problem because normally our solution should be completely and utterly quiet. Which when you compare that to your current security solutions, and I'm making the assumption that um, you probably all have some sort of SOC or, or log management solution, you will be getting hundreds or thousands of alerts a day. Where's the needle in the haystack of, of what you really need to be working on? Well, deception can very clearly do that and find that for you because nothing should ever talk to our solution. Okay. Now, a common question is, well, you know, we've got um, vulnerability scanners and and things like that. Nick will explain uh, later, you know, we can clearly whitelist those applications, the normal behavior. Okay, so um, MITRE, um, you may well have heard of, they, I, I will make sure that you receive this paper. They talk about um, the value of cyber deception. On the right hand side is really uh, what I've just described, um, you know, that, that digital pocket litter you know, being able to create randomness and unpredictability um, for an attacker. We can actually learn their techniques, useful for finding insider threats, can help your incident response. We can make you more productive because the, the alerts are high fidelity uh, and we can waste attackers time. Some of you uh, may well follow um, uh, NIST as a, as a guide for your security policy. Um, and, you know, NIST 853 yeah, absolutely talks about, you know, there are multiple NIST papers that mandate um, deception. And this one in particular talks about um, deception providing insight into adversarial tactics, techniques, procedures. We can deflect away from operational systems, obviously, by providing fakes and so on. The um, the second one, um, developing cyber resilient systems, NIST 800 160, talks about obfuscation, disinformation, misdirection, and tainting, um, and again recommends um, deception to help organizations develop um, cyber resiliency. And this last one, again, is a, is a NIST recommendation and talks about. Um, how deception can impact adversaries' decision-making processes. We can degrade their ability to move laterally, and Nick will talk um, about our threat path feature later. And it talks about how deception can divert adversaries away from your high-value assets and increase the observability of, of what um, an attacker is doing. So, you know, why deception? Um, Sorry, I'm just moving the, um, you know, an attacker can't, can't tell real from fake. They'll make mistakes. They'll touch something that they shouldn't. You can get them straight away. We increase the cost to an attacker because they're going to get caught more quickly. They'll have to come back. They might just give up and go somewhere else. It makes that economics um, undesirable for um, an attacker. Gartner. Back in 18, talked about deception being a top 10 technology trend. And even today, number two, um, I mean, effectively, all we do is, is very effective detection and incident response. Um, number two on their list this year is um, for organizations to mature their SOCs, but focus on threat detection and response, which is exactly what we do. And actually, last week at a, at a conference we attended um, in the US, they're talking about deception for threat defense being a uh, 0 to 12 month initiative 
um, for organizations. Now, um, I've put a list here, I've nearly finished my piece, but I've put a list here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read them out. I'll leave that to you, but these are common use cases um, for the use of deception. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, th th there are, it, it all depends on the organization and on their vertical market. Um, you know, retailers often want, you know, fake POS machines to, to, to lure attackers away from the real systems. We've even done in, in banking, um, fake SWIFT environments, fake ATM environments, um, in, in healthcare, uh, fake uh, medical devices um, that, that you can't patch. There are numerous, um, yeah, insider threat is another key one. Um, so here are some more. Um, cloud, we have ability to provide deception in, in multiple cloud environments. Nick will cover that. M&A is a good one. Very often we're put into uh, organizations just before uh, an M&A, um, whilst the, 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 the financial business of an organization may well be very attractive, um, very often the, the actual uh, network, um, you know, cyber resiliency hasn't been, and you can very quickly drop in a TiVo and see uh, if things are being touched. You know, is this clean? Is it not? Is this risky to buy? Have we got um, attackers in the network that, that we're going to, um, uh, you know, join to our own? And is that going to cause us risk in the future? So, um, you know, a little bit about us. We, we, we don't market uh, particularly much. Um, we, that's a deliberate strategy. Deception is designed to be under the radar. Um, but we have, uh, you know, the, the whole, you know, it would be silly for us to market, um, you know, the names of the organizations that we're trying to protect. OK, um, but there are, you know, major organizations running our solution, two of the major credit card companies, major telcos, banks, utilities, healthcare, manufacturing, military. We, we, we have the full gamut. So. Um, that was it from me um, on the company. Um, are there any questions on, on what I've covered? Certainly the analyst and NIST papers, I, I will make sure you receive from the team at Phoenix Datacom. Nick, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Mark. Can you uh, hear me okay? And can you see the screen? I can. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Cool stuff. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mark, very much indeed. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, I just got a few proposed slides to to give you a little view on the architecture, on why we do what we do, and then we'll have some time for a demonstration and hopefully some questions if you if you have any about uh, the architecture and its potential fitness for your environment. So when we're talking with customers, with prospects about uh, the, the need for deception. We tend to frame the conversation using a um, using a chart. And if you bear with me a second, I'm just going to see if I can get my slides to share properly. There we go. Well, oh, no, sorry, that's okay. sorry. So yeah, so just a little uh, a little lag in terms of uh, ticking through the slides. So. Effectively, we, we start the conversation with prospective customers with a graph that frames um, a rational increase in perimeter security spending year on year of circa 10%. Um, with the number of successful breaches, in other words, not hacks, but breaches, in other words, successful exfiltrations of data, damage or loss of intellectual property, um, as increasing faster than we are spending on perimeter security. And it's with this in mind that we encourage uh, our, our prospects, our customers, to engage a little bit of pragmatism as regards where their investments are going and whether um, a focus on perimeter security is necessarily doing anything other than breeding better attackers. And it's with this in mind that uh, turning off our focus, our attention to uh, detecting attackers who are already on the network or who are close to breaching the network 
is potentially a far, far better return on investment in terms of security and in terms of mobilizing responses to effective ingresses into the environment. And this chap, uh, Sondergaard, while he was still at Gartner, said if, if effectively exactly the same thing, is that this historical focus on preventing attackers from, from entering should uh, logically give way to more of a, an even balance of spend between prevention and detection. And this is really primarily because when left to their own devices, attackers can breach and move across a network brutally quickly. Um, the lateral movement metric there, in other words, how quickly an attacker can move from machine to machine within two hours is a crowd strike metric. And it's one that we've seen actually um, significantly exceeded. Attackers can move far, far quicker than that. But the really serious one on this slide is, is privilege escalation. In other words, when an attacker can become an administrator on the target network and effectively vanish from view. And as you guys will be aware, the Carbonac malware in 2018, I believe it was, uh, owned a complete domain of an Eastern European bank within uh, two hours. And with that in mind, then the average dwell time on the network, in other words, the amount of time an attacker can spend on the network undiscovered uh, of 78 days. This is a very conservative metric. Often it's an awful lot longer. Um, but the consensus is amongst the, uh, amongst the industry is that uh, 78 days is a long time. For an attacker to be poking around on a network with admin privileges um, and that the amount of damage the attacker will be able to do will increase proportionally to the amount of time they have undetected on the network. And so it's with this in mind that we then start to look at a, um, a re relatively simplified version of the Lockheed Martin kill chain but one I think which definitely holds water for, for conversation because we know, for example, that criminals uh, and nation states very early on will perform intelligence gathering using publicly available and non-publicly available sources to gain good knowledge of their of their attack. And this would involve, you know, good quality social engineering, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, publicly available sources, dark web information um, to really gather a complete picture of their target before then mounting the compromise and then proceeding from there. And some of our most mature deception customers do in fact perform deception far earlier in the kill chain around the intelligence gathering phase such that attackers seeking to perform reconnaissance on target organizations are greeted with fake LinkedIn profiles, professional profiles of people that uh, are fictitious or who no longer work for the company with um, a set of technology sets which are not reflective of the technologies it's used in the organization or fake Facebook accounts or LinkedIn um, profiles or um, Instagram profiles which seed the idea of an employee at the company with a certain skill set and a certain should we say maybe social a social media naivety that could potentially be spearfished or could be um, attacked within the organization if the attacker already has a point of presence so mature deception can start very very early on but typically for most of our organizations we engage post compromise now this is really where uh, we are expecting the perimeter security controls, the traditional controls to do their work and to stop the commodity, the commodity attacks on, on an organization. Um, but inevitably things will get through, um, particularly with the, the more recent focus of attackers on end users. Um, you know, we can be fairly sure that an attacker won't worry about launching an expensive zero day on the, um, on the, the, uh, the front facing firewalls if they can effectively then spearfish an employee and effectively teleport straight into the middle of the network. And so it's here really where the attacker already has a point of presence on the network that we engage. And when the attacker is trying to do reconnaissance on the environment, trying to scope out Active Directory, hunt for credentials, use stealth attacks to gather credentials from end users, this is really where deception can come in to provide a dense mesh of fake information that no legitimate system or user should ever interact with. And when they do interact with it, we have a high degree of confidence that there is something bad happening. And ultimately the insertion of deception in support or rather in, um, uh, in, in by way of, of, of slowing down the attack at phase three, we ultimately aim to stop or significantly delay phases four and five to give the inbuilt uh, security teams uh, the, the advanced knowledge, early warnings of attackers on the network so that they can then effectively mobilize and, uh, and perform effective remediation and get the attackers off. So, in order to do this, and in the spirit of presenting Ativo's capabilities on a single slide, what I'd like to do is to take you through um, a typical attack scenario, you know, from an attacker 
breaching uh, an endpoint workstation, and let's say the attacker is a traditionalist, he's used a good old-fashioned spear phishing email, weaponized with good quality malware, and um, sweetened effectively with good quality uh, reconnaissance uh, social engineering information, um, so that the email for the recipient is going to reference their personal information, their birth dates, their kids' names, their hobbies, and when the recipient gets that email, the likelihood is they will click on the link. And at this point, the attacker then has a point of presence inside the network with either um, heavy duty malware or a command and control connection out to the internet to a human attacker. And with the, we know that the first thing that the attacker is going to do is to, to perform situational awareness on the machine that they've landed on. And if they don't like the flavor of antivirus or EDR software they find there, they will just turn it off. And it's at that point that all of the commodity controls, and I use the word commodity respectfully, the commodity controls that have been left on uh, around the organization to stop attackers getting in have failed. The email filtering, the IDS, the IPS, the firewall, the EDR, the AV, all of these have largely fallen by the wayside and the attacker has largely now got an unencumbered trip internally to say, where do I go next? And in order to do that, there'll be uh, a rich seam of information on the machine he's landed on. So for example, if he looks at credentials in memory, passwords, hashes, uh, user personas, there's a strong chance that he could find, as with the Carbonac malware, um, a, uh, a domain admin password within the first few hops that could effectively spell game over for the defending security teams. He might also look for connections to other systems in the RDP, SSH, and um, SMB um, file share uh, areas in caches, in browser bookmarks, browser cookies. There's a number of different um, methods that an attacker could use to scope out adjacent devices on the network. From an attack sophistication perspective, the modern attacker may well also just start to issue queries straight into Active Directory. Uh, he can return lists of domain controllers, return lists of privileged users. He can get a huge amount of information just by sending very commodity commands straight into AD from the compromised workstation. He may decide to go super stealthy and advertise himself internally as a legitimate corporate device, a corporate server from which he can harvest credentials of real users on the network seeking to authenticate. And I believe it was fashionable for a while to, to, uh, to follow the notion that an attacker would no longer scan the network using reconnaissance methods. Um, believe me, they do. They just do it an awful lot more stealthily these days um, in a way that is designed to sail under the radar of the IDS and the IPS systems. And I think also we were we were starting to be trained to believe that uh, that ransomware was going away. Clearly, it's not. There's obviously the the new strains of uh, COVID-19 themed ransomware and destructware that we're seeing, um, and then also the you know the, the legacy you know things like Shamoon, for example, which was launched on the Saudi government and which rendered I think 30,000 desktops um, irre irreparable by the replacement of system files with that that very compelling picture of the drowned child refugee as a political statement. So an awful lot of these techniques and tactics are still tried and tested and are still delivering significant cost and inconvenience to, to modern organizations. And then finally, document access. The attacker will be looking for information that will describe business processes, that will describe internal users, uh, systems, platforms, those kinds of things, maybe even passwords. And with all of this information, the attacker is in a position where he can identify a target system of interest from which he can derive some kind of value. And with all of these vectors and all these methods in mind that an attacker can use to move across the network and to find target systems, it's really difficult to know where to start with protecting against these kinds of um, ingresses. But with a TiVo, what we do is we just make sure it's all fake. And so with that in mind, the attacker seeking to move quietly um, with impunity across the network to find target systems that can be monetized is presented with a dense mesh of fake uh, information that will lead him to decoy systems, lead him away from the production systems, and lead him to a position where he's starting to generate alerts for us rather than anything monetizable or strategically advantageous for him. So I'm just going to pause for a second um, in a, like an open an open seminar like this. There may not be um, a, a desire to ask questions openly. Please feel free to, to ask them now. But I think the next slide might answer a, a few of them in terms of how we do what we do. So architecturally, let's take a look at the architecture of the Ativo solution and let's um, sort of walk through the connectivity and the, co the components that we rely upon to provide this deception substrate. 
So the core of the solution is an appliance called the BotSync. The BotSync is presented as a physical, virtual or cloud-based appliance, which houses a number of deceptive operating systems along with uh, component services, Active Directory, applications, data and interactive attack surfaces. These all reside on the BotSync itself, as I say, physical, virtual or cloud-based. And when I say cloud, I, can, I mean um, Amazon, uh, Azure, Google Cloud, Oracle Cloud, and these uh, bot syncs, the, the physical uh, bot sync, for example, is presented to the network across VLAN trunks into the data center and into the user networks. And with visibility of these VLANs, we can then start to assume IP addresses for our decoy systems on these networks. So you'll see these decoy systems are um, manifesting on these um, production networks, although any interaction with these systems ends up on the appliance rather than on these, these networks themselves. So these network-based decoys form the first point of early visibility for attackers who might be scanning the network, performing broadcast or multicast-based attacks, who might be um, attempting to infiltrate the network from adjacent IoT-type networks, or who are seeking not to be caught by interacting uh, in other ways. So these are effectively your first port of call for network-based attacks. But if you see the production assets here, which are regularly colored, the, the deceptive assets are in orange, the regular assets, workstations and servers, also have these credential cards on them. These are a trail of breadcrumbs that we lead for an attacker to lead them into our decoys. So an attacker landing on this workstation might be looking for a password in memory, um, an RDP connection, uh, a browser cookie, a bookmark. And we make sure that uh, there is plenty of information here for them to find that will lead them towards our decoys. And so in combination, and given that the vast majority of attacks do occur on endpoint workstations, it's these credential cards here that prov provide the attacker with the, the surface, the, uh, effectively the, the enticement to interact with decoys. But we also know, for example, that attackers are now far more uh, likely, far more willing to engage with Active Directory directly. So if an attacker breaches this, this workstation here, you know, he's, he's effectively logged on as a regular, a regular user. Active Directory by default will trust that user, authenticated to the domain. Um, Active Directory has no reason not to return responses so that when this attacker uh, masquerading as this user queries Active Directory directly, and says, give me a list of domain controllers, the return response is sent to the, uh, to the attacker, but the Ativo endpoint capability here, called AD Secure, returns fake information to the attacker. So rather than getting a list of production domain controllers, or a list of domain admins, or a list of enterprise admins, or a list of Kerberos tickets, the attacker gets fake information leading, again, to the decoys, such that any attempt to authenticate to those assets or using those users will raise alerts. And then the final piece, really, with, uh, with ransomware specifically in mind, if we detect cryptographic processes in action on our network, we can not only hide production uh, assets from those cryptographic processes, we can also send them into uh, deceptive libraries, deceptive file shares, effectively, that contain fake data, which self-replicates. In other words, we give the, the cryptographic process an infinite library of self-replicating data to encrypt that keeps it busy while the SOC teams approach patient zero and get it quarantined and contain the threat. Now, all of this information, all of these, these use cases apply not only to, to central uh, data center type environments, but also to remote networks. We've got a number of capabilities to scale us out to, to remote uh, sites and also into the cloud as well. And the, the ability to operate in a truly hybrid fashion as well. So as with most organizations, if you want to provide a deceptive layer to both your, um, your data center and to your cloud properties, then you can do that with a single pane of glass that will allow unified management of deception regardless of your IT supply chain choices. So with that in mind, a highly flexible solution that, that allows all sorts of different deceptions across all sorts of different environments. I'm gonna skip through this slide um, and get on to what is affectionately titled the pancake slide here, which really reiterates the point that I just made. And that is at the bottom here, if you look at the supply chain choices that you might've made in terms of virtualization, cloud, open source, or physical, the Ativo solution has the ability to surface um, deceptive operating systems of all different types. And if you if you don't see your desired one here, please don't worry. Um, typically we we import gold images to the uh, the platform to make sure that our our solution is um, is appropriate and relevant to the um, to the types of, of asset that you're you're putting down. I'm just going to back through here. There we go. But also then populated with um, 
with interactive data with applications that will then return um, an attractive interactive surface to the attacker who is seeking to compromise specific vulnerabilities and specific services on those platform choices that you've made. And this includes, for example, industrial control systems, SCADA systems, the, the, uh, the less IT, the, the less commodity type attack surfaces, and even into things like IoT, um, healthcare devices, those kinds of things. And I've got a lot of personal experience in using these things in healthcare environments where we've, we've actually found zero days using the Ativo solution. And then the final part of the uh, of the capability really is, uh, is these lures, these breadcrumbs that we put on the workstations uh, that include a number of different methods of getting an attacker to believe that they're proceeding with their attack and to give them data to interact with that will lead them into decoys rather than into production systems. And then really the penultimate slide talks about our native integrations. Now within the Ativo solution, we spent a long time and a lot of effort getting our integrations uh, exactly where, where we believe they need to be. And this includes an ability to use um, the vast majority of, uh, of the, the, the standard security tooling that you guys will be using in your environments for things like quarantine, blocking, forensics, analysis, but also into the more kind of rarefied use cases like, for example, protecting cloud applications. So we can provide deceptive logins, deceptive information for cloud applications, such that if you see deceptive assets um, or rather deceptive uh, logins being used against your cloud applications, then you can far more easily triangulate an attacker on the network. We have automatic integrations into things like ServiceNow for ticketing and a very, very well-featured, not only API, but also in a capability to, uh, to use automations to, to make sure that any uh, playbooks that you want to support, automated actions you want to support into your, uh, your SOC workflows can then be supported. But for example, using... Um, our firewall integrations, let's say we identify a bad guy on the network talking to a deceptive asset, we can very, very quickly engage an API call to the firewall to take that, that endpoint and either remove it from the network or to cut its command and control connection um, and those kinds of things. So the very, very well, um, well architected or automatic integrations, that mean you can contain threats very quickly on first point of visibility of an attack, an attack method. So with that in mind, um, I have a quick demonstration of um, our AD secure capability that I'd like to start with. But in order to do that, I just wanted to very quickly run through how it works and what the workflow looks like, because um, the AD secure demo, demo is, is very, very compelling, but it's primarily command line. So um, what I, I like to do is really just to, to present a picture of an attacker here on a workstation. Now, as I said earlier, the workstation will by default be trusted by Active Directory so that if the attacker issues a command into AD, um, the real query results, you know, whether that's a list of domain admins or a list of domain controllers, will be presented back to the attacker only to be intercepted by AD Secure and replaced with fake information. So the attacker here is receiving information he believes to be authentic and real from, from Active Directory, but really what is happening is that he's being fed stolen credentials and stolen information that lead him into decoy systems rather than into production assets. And we do this without making any changes to production AD, which is critically important. So um, we're effectively hiding the real results back from AD, presenting fake ones to the attacker. So with that in mind, and again, Mark, um, I'd like to uh, ask for you just to check that this is presenting okay? Absolutely, yeah. Perfect, okay, good stuff. I'm just gonna, um, right, so on the screen, what we have here is, um, is two systems, two virtualized client systems, both connected to the same Active Directory infrastructure um, with one difference. The red one is an unprotected system, and the green one is protected with Ativo AD Secure. And so as an attacker, you know, when I land on, a, on a, um, a production system, there are a number of commands that I can run into this production system that will give me um, invaluable information about the, uh, about the domain. For example, NLTest DC list gives me a list of domain controllers. And so I've got a list of domain controllers returned by this, um, by this particular uh, AD um, infrastructure I'm connected to. And if I run a DS get DC command, then that's gonna give me the domain controller to which I'm currently connected. All very interesting so far. But if, for example, relatively emboldened by my success with the previous couple of commands, I run a net group for the domain admins and run that into the domain itself, then 
I get a list of domain admins and I can start to enumerate then the important people on the network. And if I run something like NetSess, for example, against the domain, then I get a list of active sessions within the AD environment, including one for Dwight here, who is one of our domain admins. So as an attacker with four commands, I've already got more information about your AD architecture than you would ever want me to have. So from this particular perspective, and if I, for example, decide that I want to do even more than that, you know, run, for example, a K-list command, I'm now returning Kerberos tickets, and I've now got enough information to hijack an active session into your domain architecture and effectively create myself a backdoor account on your AD, and then I'm, I'm gone from view. I'm, I'm mostly undetectable by that point. So let's turn our attention to the protected system now. And if I run an NL test DC list against this particular system, then you'll see, again, I get a list of domain controllers, but these, these machines are connected to the same Active Directory infrastructure. So why is my PDC here for the protected system different from the unprotected system? Well, the answer is AD Secure has intercepted the responses of these queries and has replaced the real information with fake information. This is an absolutely fake domain controller here. Any attempt to authenticate to this is going to start to raise alerts. Similarly, if I run another DS get DC command, again against the protected system, then I'm connected to the PDC here, but you'll see it's very, very different to the production one. So again, I'm starting to seed with the attacker this idea that um, he's getting real information about the production infrastructure, but what is being returned actually is absolutely fake. So for example, running against the, uh, the domain admins again, these are our domain admins, and I think you'll agree, agree that they're clearly very, very different to the ones that we return from production. And again, if I run a NetSess on this, forgive my typing, then you'll see, again, our Gandalf ADM guy here is actually logged in to the PDC. So I've got a session I can potentially hijack. Before I do that, maybe I want more information about Gandalf himself. Um, there it is. So, um, forgive me, net user. So I can validate this user Gandalf himself, you know, there, there he is, he's got an active account, his account doesn't expire, he's had a password change, he's last login at, at a certain particular point in time, and he's in fact a member of the domain admins. So I'm effectively validating that this guy Gandalf, as an administrator on the network, has got an active session into one of our DCs, I can run again a K-list command to pull out an active Kerberos ticket. And I've now got enough information as an attacker to believe I can Kerberos this particular guy, but really there's not going to be any value in doing that because it's going to be generating alerts and going to be betray my position on the network. So with that in mind, let me just quickly go into the Utivo console here and I will give you a view on how that manifests from a telemetry perspective because um, what we have is the ability to um, present this information to um, real users within the the, um, the Ativo solution. So the Ativo dashboard, I'm gonna go into more detail in a little while, and um, I'm running across a VPN to the States here, so I hope you'll um, you'll forgive a little bit of latency, but you'll see straight away here, you know, I've started to, to enumerate domain users, I've enumerated sessions, I've enumerated group and privileges. So these alerts are already propagating through to illustrate what I've been doing as an attacker on the environment. There are no other detection solutions in the world that would have spotted that. If there's an attacker, I could have sailed completely under the radar using those methods. And yet within Ativo, if I go, for example, into my AD Secure reports, then I've got very, very clear visibility of everything that the attacker did down to the individual commands here, for example. So you saw me run these commands against Gandalf, against all of these particular domain admins, and I've betrayed my position here from a machine name, from an IP address. I've even... Uh, demonstrated the types of injection that I've done into processes to allow me to run my particular um, my particular exploits here, including whether this, this has been assigned um, capability, whether it's an API call or console input. So we've got a huge amount of valuable telemetry about this particular attack, about what the attacker was doing, um, but also um, from the perspective of um, visibility, we've identified things on the network that no other system would have seen. And all this without making any changes to production active directory. 
So I'm just going to log into another system quickly, and I'm going to um, show you a little bit more of the interface. I'll run through how it's architected, what it's telling you, run through some of the key visualizations in the prod and the product, and then we'll run a live attack scenario. So the, the, the dashboard within Ativo is a, an ergonomic kind of flat, easy to interpret dashboard, a 30,000 foot view, if I could use a cliche, into the deception architecture. And the deception architecture here is telling us a little bit about the key metrics about where we've deployed. So we've discovered, uh, for example, uh, a number of different VLANs where we've put decoys. We've discovered uh, a large number of IPs of which um, there are only a relatively smaller number active at the moment. And we've put down a number of active decoys on the network. Similarly, a TiVo endpoint has been installed in a number of different places, and we've discovered a number of threat paths. This is a very important metric. A uh, threat path is um, a, uh, a place, a path across the network that exploits passwords that have been orphaned by, for example, domain admins and left on machines. Um, we can identify where those passwords have been left in memory on, on workstations and on servers and draw paths across the network with criticality to show if an attacker were to land there, how far they could get using uh, those, uh, those different uh, passwords. We also have an inbuilt malware sandbox, which will allow us to run, uh, to run executable content that's been put into our decoys um, within a completely self-contained environment. So the solution itself is really architected for high visibility and for uh, to be able to mobilize the analysis and the interpretation of these, these data within the, the appliance itself. Now, a couple of things that you'll uh, you'll notice here, for example, uh, within the uh, the dashboard itself, we have these really nice uh, donut charts. Um, and with the legend on the donut charts, we can just click out things that we're not interested in and concentrate on things that we maybe are interested in. So the ability to then interact with the data in such a way and expose hyperlinked um, uh, categories, for example, here, high severity information we would drill into. Here, for example, we will be drilling into access class events or credential type events. And the ability to interact with these donut charts is a really, really nice way to mobilize around the data. You'll also see where we see a hyperlink on a timeline, for example, it is one, this would take us into May the 7th. And on the right hand side here, if I concentrate on high severity events, you'll see then we've got hyperlinks into specific events like deceptive credential usages, like critical threat paths, and like failed logins to our decoys. So we've got a really, really uh, nice and easy to interpret um, dash here that takes us into information of interest very, very quickly. On the lower part of the screen at the moment, you'll see our infected systems. These are the bad guys. These are the things that are talking to the deceptive architecture, the attacks they're using, the services that they're running, and the target operating systems, just in case there is a particular vulnerability or a class of exploit that's being used that you can identify as affecting particular assets. But with these bad guys, for example, if I run into these, then you'll see very, very quickly that we've got a, a clear visibility, clear visualization of the attackers and how many attacks they've actually run. I can highlight any one of these guys and quarantine them for within here. We've got a number of pre-built integrations in the product for the demo perspective. This could be one of 35 or so that we actually run. And you can actually take this guy off the network very, very quickly and, um, and quarantine or, or isolate the threat. But again, for any of these particular attacks, I can click on this and I will get a perspective on the end user or the, the attacker machine itself here. Dot 19 is um, running from this MAC address on VLAN 16. It has um, no Ativo capabilities installed on the endpoint, and we've got a profile of, of information that it's running here that we can interact with in the same way that we did the previous diagram. We also got a very, very clear way that we can start to interact with this information by running forensics, a forensics capture against this machine, against triggering automations, or against, for example, running PCAP, CSV, sticks, or IOC export of all of this event data that we have against this guy. You can quarantine him from here as well, or you can whitelist his IP, which I probably wouldn't advise using this uh, particular attacker. But if we scroll down, for example, also you'll see then we've got great granular information about what the attacker has been doing on this particular decoy. So attacking from this IP into this target IP, which is a Windows 7 machine, um, and running an inbound RDP connection on port 3389. You can see all of the attacks that this guy was doing, and you can, again, export individual event reports for these individual attacks. So great visibility of the attacker, great visibility of what they've been doing, and really, really nice and easy to navigate from the top level dashboard. 
So I think you'll agree, a very, very easy to interpret, easy to navigate front page, but we also have additional visualizations in the product um, because we have, for example, a, a unique and peculiar fascination with broadcast and multicast traffic, we can start going into things like a network view here, which is articulated and drawn derived from broadcast and multicast traffic, but which allows us to present a very, very clear picture of the BotSync itself, our appliance, with the respective decoy VMs that it's connected to, and a very, very clear granular view on the VLANs that are connected. So what we're doing here effectively is providing discovery information to the assets connected to VLAN 40, which is then connected into the bot sync here. So for example, green are active assets on the network. And if you, if you hover over the asset, you can see things about the operating system, the vendor, the, um, the services it's running, the VLAN it's on. Um, the gray assets are inactive devices that have been seen on the, on the network in the last month. And the orange assets are deceptive. So you've got a very, very clear, very, very logical view of where the assets are, which ones are active, and which ones are sat alongside decoys on the production network. I can collapse this down and really, really nice, easy to navigate view of the, of the environment with filters that can be applied, for example, to take a perspective on where these devices are active, for example, which VLAN they're on, or maybe even you know to show particular vendor devices. Maybe I'm just interested in Hewlett Packard devices here. And I can recalculate that view just based on the HP devices that I see on this particular network. Really, really valuable if you have specific vulnerabilities or specific uh, targets that you think attackers are, are going, going after. And if I want to remove that filter, I can just click on the X here and it takes me straight back out. One of the other things I can do with this particular view, I can view, view it tabularly. I can look for outliers here, for example, by looking at unusual proportions of broadcast and multicast traffic. I can also raise alerts based on the visibility to a TiVo of either new VLANs or new endpoints. If you have a, a highly controlled environment like a Swift environment or um, a medical device environment, you don't want to, to, to see new endpoints appearing on that network. And so we can raise alerts if that happens against specific networks as well. So with all of that information, you can start to exert very, very high degrees of control over the environment. Um, and in terms of what you allow and the, the configuration, the endpoint based changes you allow to happen on those networks. But if I then take a view, for example, from an attacker's, um, or, or rather an operative's perspective about attacker activity on the network, we can start to then present graphical views of how the attackers are interacting with the environment. So you'll see here, we've got a month's worth of high severity activity. Now, with this specifically in mind, very, very worthwhile because we can straight away start to look at who the attackers are talking to. The attack propagation here, for example, shows this particular attacker on the dot 200 IP is uh, talking to our CentOS decoy via a deceptive credential alert here. He's logged into one of our decoys using fake credentials. Or here, for example, he's generated some swift activity against one of our CentOS decoys um, and also logged into a different IP here, this the dot uh, 52, 62 IP and the dot 35 IP as contrasted with the dot 10. So very, very clear visibility of what the attacker is actually running on the network. And if I go straight back out again, zoom out, you'll see I can do this for all the, the individual attacks that I've observed on the network to get perspective on what these people are doing. You can also run forensics from the right, the right click here. You can run uh, a whitelist against this IP. You can quarantine him, use our, our existing integrations, and you can run playbooks, automated actions, to get the attacker off the network and to get forensics from their machine automatically. But we also have the, the ability, for example, to, to present a video playback of a particular attack. So what you see here, I hope this is scrolling okay for you across a WAN link, but we've got a, a real-time uh, replay of the attack showing how the attackers were joining the network, what methods they were using, where they started, where they finished, and a really, really nice visualization to demonstrate how an attack has proceeded with the ability to pause and replay at any particular point in time to show what specific methods the attackers were using at a particular point in their, their campaign. So really, really valuable visualizations, really valuable information about, um, about what the attacker was doing. All this information can be exported and um, put into um, industry standard formats, IOC sticks, CSV PCAPs. Uh, we can also even then filter this information for more specific in, um, information about maybe just payload drop type activity here. So if I run that, this will just show me a specific attacker here that's dropped payload onto one of our Ubuntu decoys. So you can start to use the filters to very, very finely dissect the information that we've produced. 
I'm going to pause for a second just to check if there are any questions. I do have some questions that have come through in the chat, but I can bring those out in the Q&A at the end. Perfect. OK, thank you. So with that in mind, um, let's just go to a couple more visualizations. I want to get a few minutes for questions um, towards the end. So I've got a few more things to show. And I guess one of the important things really um, from an ease of automation and installation perspective is that most of the people that we speak to, most of our customers are plenty busy enough managing a production infrastructure without worrying about a deceptive one as well. And this really segues very, very nicely into one of our key capabilities, which is our ability to learn from the production network and to adapt and to automatically configure our decoys based on what we find there. And what I mean by that is we can learn from uh, Active Directory and we can learn from network traffic. And in doing this, we can discover the machine names on the network, the credential types, the credential names, the critical assets, the services that, that are being put out onto the network. And as a result of all that learning, which typically can, can complete in as little as two hours on a, on a busy network, we can make a list of suggested campaigns, deception campaigns, that we recommend putting onto this environment to sit alongside what we've discovered there. So, for example, you know, web servers, uh, database servers, file servers, maybe some industrial control systems, some emulated vulnerabilities, which is another capability. And we make recommendations within these decoys as well. So in this instance, we've not only recommended things like DNS names for the decoys, we've also discovered IP addresses. And we are also recommending specific MAC addresses that are prefixed with a vendor specific first three octets. So in this instance, an attacker seeking to fingerprint decoys based on, for example, virtualized MAC addresses will be confronted with a MAC address for this particular decoy, um, which will have not only a DNS name that checks out against DNS, but also a MAC address that looks like it's a real device rather than a virtualized device sat on an TiVo appliance. So in that particular way, we are making sure that this attack surface looks, smells, and feels like the real thing to an attacker to encourage them to interact with it. Now, with that in mind, I guess it's um, it's incumbent on me to, to give you a little bit of a, a view in, in you know inside the uh, the appliance itself, because the the physical appliances in this instance, one of our smaller appliances, a 3200, contains six deceptive operating systems, a, a mix of Windows and Linux. You can import your own custom ones, but this six operating systems can produce over 2,000 decoys on a network and can scale to thousands of VLANs. So you've got huge amounts of coverage, even from the, the smaller appliances, and you also have the flexibility against all of these decoys to be able to customize. So for example, our CentOS virtual machine here can produce thousands of decoy IPs on the network. And if you don't want them, for example, to, to produce a postfix mail um, service, then you can just turn it off in the interface. And it's with this method that you can then start to exert control over the a further control over the services you're exposing on your environment to make it look and feel more to an attacker like the real environment. So I guess from, from the configuration, the deployment perspective, the, the point I'm making is that this solution is very, very strongly geared towards, and I won't say self-installation because nothing is self-installing, but a very, very, uh, very much higher level of automation to installation, a faster time to value and a much lower uh, footprint on the production SOC and NOC staff to get this in and working. So some additional capabilities within the solution, we talk around threat ops. Threat ops is our integration nexus effectively. This is the means by which we can integrate with things like blocking, threat intelligence, but also SIM solutions here. Now, the reason I paused on the SIM solution is because, you know, we can send syslog to anything. Um, and syslog, you know, um, syslog connections into any security solution is 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 so commodity it's not even really worth mentioning. However, with these the, what we call the big four, the big four major SIM vendors here, ArcSight, Logarithm, QRadar, and Splunk, we do some additional things. So let me give you a, a fictional scenario. Let's say, for example, we've created a deceptive credential on our network called Mark underscore ADM. It's a deceptive uh, credential that's going to look like a domain admin credential to a an attacker, it will authenticate perfectly happily to decoys and will raise a deceptive credential alert when it does. However, if you are logging using your SIM for failed logins using credentials here, then we can take that mark underscore ADM and check the arc site, the logarithm, the QRadar and the Splunk index at intervals for instances of that deceptive credential showing up in production. 
which means that you've got 360 degree visibility of uh, deceptive assets, not only in deception, but also in the production environment, which is very, very valuable because you can then identify arguably a more severe condition, which is where an attacker has got a credential and is trying to use it against a production asset. Similarly, we've got the blocking capability. So we've, with a couple of clicks, a couple of kind of key pieces of information about IP addresses and authentication, you can configure blocking so that any attacker interacting with our decoy using these technologies on your environment, you can take them away from production assets, quarantine them and start the incident response process. And additionally, our threat intelligence integrations start with things like the FireEye Fire appliances for malware analysis, although we do it ourselves internally too, uh, but also things like McAfee DXL to propagate IOCs across the DXL fabric and threat intelligence sources like VirusTotal and Reversing Labs. So the ability to use publicly available, um, even proprietary commercial threat intelligence sources to enrich the information that you're getting from, from your Ativo implementation. And just a couple of other things. I mean, obviously you saw the uh, the integration slide, the huge number of, of uh, native integrations that we, we have within the solution, which can be brought to bear using our playbook capability. And in this particular instance, let's say that we wanna run a, an alert for an attacker who's interacting with the bot sync. So in the first instance, potentially what I wanna do is I wanna run forensics against the attacker machine. I maybe wanna log the event out to Splunk Maybe I'll spin some some extra deception up on the network to keep the guy busy. And maybe I'll log this whole event out to ServiceNow as a ticket. Now, when I hit save on this, this becomes a de facto workflow that can be either automatically or manually engaged against any attacker that I see on the network. So as long as these integrations, and you'll see we have a large number of these configured for demonstration here, um, as long as these integrations are configured, they will feature as a capability on the um, on the, uh, uh, the, the bot sync and allow you to perform these automated actions against attackers that have touched deceptive assets. So just two more things that I wanted to show. Um, I never believe that these demos should be tests of endurance, so I hope you guys are all, are all still with me. Um, I like to talk a little bit about threat path. Threat path is, is um, effectively where our visibility and our kind of intimate knowledge of Active Directory in customer environments comes to converge with what we observe on production assets. So what I mean by that is by learning from Active Directory, we can identify privileged users, critical assets, um, devices that are important to the organization, and effectively then to present a um, scorecard view showing where vulnerabilities and where critical paths into high severity assets, high severity targets could, could exist. And you'll see here, we discover, for example, RDP credentials in memory. We discover, for example, where admin users have got the same password for privileged and unprivileged accounts. We identify where there are um, paths across the network using VPN, for example. And these critical paths can then be produced graphically on the environment so that we can then show very, very clearly for one of these machines, for example, my machine here, showing that there are a bunch of credentials on this particular um, machine and Palmer here will give me um, an HTTP path across the network to this machine. Richemont here will give me a VPN credential path across to this machine. And um, this machine, I've got an RDP, an active RDP session into a domain controller. So what we're able to do with these path views is to show you how far an attacker could get on the network using the credentials that have been orphaned or left on these machines. Now that's very, very valuable because obviously it shows you vulnerabilities on the network that an attacker could exploit to move across to critical assets. But we also have the ability to itemize these in great detail, highlight them as real credentials here, and perform a remediation. So if we want to remediate these particular credentials to remove them from this machine and replace them with fake ones, we can do that. And in doing that, we effectively remove and significantly reduce the attack surface on this machine for an attacker. We also have the, the ability, for example, to take one of these machines and present mm -hmm. vulnerabilities on these machines. Now, in this particular instance, for example, you see that we've got multiple admins on this computer. We've got non-expiring passwords. We've got the page file not being cleared at shutdown. All of these conditions here could be uh, improved, could be hardened with a GPL, with a policy change to make it harder for an attacker to move from this machine to a, co a critical corporate asset. 
So in combination with visibility of orphan passwords on this environment and vulnerabilities on the machine, we're in a position where we can provide solid advisory to customers about how to harden their environment to make it more difficult for an attacker to move across, across the network. So that's the threat path. And as I say, it's very, very clear, easy to, uh, to interpret. And you can also then start specifying rules, for example, so that if, for example, you never ever want to see an RDP credential in memory anywhere on the environment, you can automatically remediate that from within this. So that if you ever see a machine with an RDP credential in memory, it's automatically scrubbed and made, uh, made safe. So what I'd like to do next as a final, a final part of the of the uh, the demonstration is to show you a little bit about how we detect real attacks. And in order to do that, I want to show you a little bit about the breadcrumbs that we use, because the breadcrumbs that you find on a real machine, this command pr uh, prompt is on my machine, this is real production workstation. And you'll see if I run a command key, then this machine is absolutely littered with fake credentials. Um, Obviously, from a production perspective, you wouldn't necessarily use Star Wars names, but um, the idea is, is that these credentials are here for attackers to find on this particular machine. And if I go into Windows Credential Manager, what you'll see is that um, the Windows credentials on this machine, there are numerous of them. Now, these were created probably six months ago when I installed the Ativo endpoint. And you'll see, for example, in this particular machine, the .18 IP here, Access DB Admin is, is a, a deceptive credential. It has a password on my machine. So if an attacker fires up Mimikatz and tries to scrape out a password from memory, he will get a credential that will authenticate him to this machine, which will be decoy and which will gener generate alerts. The interesting wrinkle here is that this particular credential, even though it's never been used, looks like it's only just been modified, only just been accessed. So by messing with the timestamps on these credentials in memory, we can make them look real to an attacker and make the attacker believe that they are safe to use in, um, in authenticating against production assets. So with that in mind, let's say that I found myself an interesting asset on the network, maybe using my weapons, uh, my weapons grade nation state SSH client here. I've identified an interesting asset and I'm going to connect to it. So in this particular instance, I've already stolen a username, a Star Wars themed username, and I'm going to start to try and log in to this particular system. Now, with that in mind, um, when I get into this system, you'll see it's, um, it's let me in because I got the password correct because I'd stolen it from a real client. And so I believe that this is a correct password. I can interact with the file system. You know, I can start to make directories on the file system, check that they've been created. I can upload content to this. I can run a process minus EF command, for example, to see what's running on the system. I can query the network interfaces to identify anything there. I can even ping adjacent devices on the environment for example, and it looks and feels exactly like a real Linux system because that's exactly what it is. So from an attacker perspective, I'm just going to remove my hack directory. This is a shared system. From an attacker perspective, I'm having a really good day. I've identified a system, I've stolen a credential, and I've established myself a point of presence elsewhere on the environment. However, what I don't know is that um, on from a, a, a perspective of a, an Ativo um, solution everything that's just happened has been under a million watt spotlight so for example here is my first point of visibility of the attack my inbound ssh command into a um a decoy from a, uh, an ip address and here is my deceptive credential usage drilling on this deceptive credentials are our highest severity alert you'll see here so here's my attacker ip here's the target ip i've gone against and is the operating system and if i scroll down and across here you will see everything that i just did from first log on to exploring the file system, making a directory, checking it was created, running a process command, running ifconfig and loopback ping, and then removing my hack directory. Everything I did on this environment has been captured and can be exported as sticks, IOC, CSV, and PCAP, as well as being able to then, for example, if I'm a junior SOC operative, and I don't know what a deceptive credential alert is, then we tell you within the product, and these tooltips exist for every single one of our 800 or so alerts, and I also tell you how to mitigate or to fix this particular condition on the environment. So really, really superb telemetry, very detailed attacker intimacy in terms of what they've done on our environment, uh, all presented in a really, really nice, easy to interpret dashboard. So guys, um, that was everything I wanted to show for today. Um, I hope this is a bit of interest. I've left a few minutes for questioning, so um, or questions. So uh, Richard, you said that there were some questions or if there's anybody that, that would like to ask any now, I'd be very, very happy to hear them. 
Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. So if I can just um, grab the screen, can you all see my screen now? Yep. Yeah, okay, lovely. So yeah, I've had three questions that have come in through the chat facility. Um, first one is, how do you conceal a TiVo from attackers? Okay, this is a great question. So, um, so I mean, there are an awful no lot of things that have been specifically architected in the product to um, to conceal a TiVo. So, for example, with our endpoint capability, you know, we we conceal the service by giving it a deceptive service name. We have the ability to sign our executable with uh, with custom certs, so the binaries don't show up to to attackers. We can even obfuscate the landing page into Ativo. We can put access control lists on the Ativo solution. The, the console itself is protected against brute force and those kinds of attacks. So there's a whole array of things that we do, um, including the ability to change the logo on our, our splash screen to look at, to make it look like something customer specific. So, you know, you can make this look like a, a, a very, very anonymous and innocuous internal server without alerting the, the attackers to, to the possibility it could be something that, there, that is there to catch them. Okay. Okay, lovely. Thank you. And uh, second question, um, how do you make your deception appeal? So by appeal, I guess uh, the, the, probably the question relates to uh, whether and how to get an attacker to interact with the decoys. And uh, again, it's a great question. Um, and I mean, back in the days of, of what you would call the, the, the much more rudimentary honeypots, uh, it was a, a very real challenge. You could put a, you know, um, a vulnerable XP or Windows 7 machine on the network and it would be largely a, a matter of chance as to whether the attack would find it. What we have with modern deception solutions is not only the ability to scale these things way past single or even multiple uh, machines, because we're using virtualization, we can scale these things dozens, hundreds, or thousands of times across the network, but also we can introduce ourselves into the attacker workflow. So if an attacker lands on a workstation uh, looking for reconnaissance, clues, passwords about the surrounding architecture, we can make sure they find deceptive stuff and by interacting with that, they are providing alerts. And similarly with um, with network scans, even the stealthiest or uh, most subtle network scan can be detected with a TiVo. So we've tuned the solution to be, um, rather than to detect attackers kind of crashing around and bumping into things like the old honeypots, this solution is designed and architected to detect attackers who are tiptoeing around and actively trying to avoid detection. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and the last question we've had in is where would I start? And, and I'm thinking that, bearing in mind you've covered that you, you do Active Directory, um, Endpoint, and uh, Network Detection, uh, I, I'm guessing that the question comes from a standpoint of is, is there like a, a, an initial place to start rather than you know, going all out? Yes, there absolutely is. I mean, and I think um, my view is on this is that experience is the best teacher. You know, m uh, everybody in this call is going to have experience, anecdotal or otherwise, of um, of uh, attacks that they've seen on the network. And um, so typically, you know, we start with vulnerable user groups or user groups that are known to routinely fail the spear phishing drills. We start with critical assets. We start with um, ingress points from, for example, machines that are internet facing, you know, get onto uh, adjacent networks to protect there, um, or I mean, particularly around critical data. So for example, you know, in pharmaceutical environments, your deceptive data, your fake information might be around either clinical trial files, which will inevitably segue to medical records or um, research compounds, you know, drugs for, for candidate research to become blockbuster drugs. And so, but with a, a careful kind of risk-based approach over your data, over your user community and over the criticality of your assets, we can inevitably find something to get uh, a customer started with a deception solution. Um, and inevitably, when people see the value, they, they, they start to roll it out wider anyway. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, okay. that, that's all of the questions that we've had. So um, unless anybody has any other um, questions they want to throw our way, um, I'd like to thank you both um, for your contributions today. Very good presentation and demo. Um, and just for everyone on the line um, watching, your Phoenix Datacom account manager will be in contact with you very shortly. Um, but if there is anything that you need in the meal in the meantime, please do um, let us know. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard, for the opportunity. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nick. Bye.